Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about Colin Teven's play Alcameon in Corinth. So this is an adaptation of sorts, um, because uh, Alcameon in Corinth was originally a Euripides play, but today only some fragments of it survive. So we do have the broad outlines of the story recorded in Apollodorus's Library of Greek Myths, but we don't know exactly what Euripides did with it. And so one of the things that Teven has attempted to do, uh, working with a, a, with a theater producer and a classicist, is trying to fit these fragments into a contemporary framework. So the play is very clearly 21st century and concerned with 21st century issues, but it's set in it's set in the framework of the Alcmaeon story. So um, Alcmaeon was one of the seven against Thebes. So he, he fought in that conflict. They were uh, so. Let me make sure I've got this right. So, actually, sorry, hold on. Alcmaon's father was one of the seven against Thebes uh, who were defeated and betrayed by Alcmaon's mother. Alcmaon later goes with a group uh, of the sons of those warriors and destroys Thebes in revenge. But, Alcmaeon, because his mother sold them out for a gold necklace, he murders his mother. Uh, with her dying breath, she curses him and calls down the Irenes, or the Furies, or the Kindly Ones. They have a lot of different names. But they these are the, the primordial ancestor goddesses who pursue... Uh, for instance, Orestes in the Oresteia, they pursue him and punish him for, for having murdered his mother. They do the same thing with Alcmaeon, except rather than brutal torments, Alcmaeon is punished by uh, having to have sex with a ton of women as he travels across Greece, which uh, as some people have commented, is hardly the worst Greek punishment in the canon of Greek literature. Um, but one of the things that uh, we get very clearly in in Teban's version is the sense in which this is a punishment. Because Alcmaeon is punished by desire. So what I mean by that is that the continual embrace of enjoyment, the continual embrace of doing something pleasant actually deadens the pleasure and to the point where uh, it simply becomes a chore. And so in a way what the punishment is for Alcman having murdered his mother is essentially the loss of uh, sexual pleasure in the sense that it simply it becomes something that he is compelled to do rather than something that he chooses to do or even something that he seeks out doing. So that's uh, Alcman's issue here, or that's his, his background rather. What happens in the play is that um, 16 years earlier, Alcman had left his children, uh, Tisiphone and Amphilicus, with Cruesa, who uh, was his former lover, who's now married to Creon, king of Corinth. Um, Creon is now uh, sexually obsessed with the girl who he thinks is his daughter, Tisiphone, uh, and Cruesa is convinced that if she doesn't get rid of Tisiphone, Creon will uh, have sex with her and throw Cruesa out. So Cruesa is all about trying to protect her position as queen. Uh, so Cruesa gets 
Nicoretta, who's the, the priestess of Aphrodite, to take both of the children, uh, Tisiphone and uh, Amphilicus, um, basically take them away and sell them as slaves. Nicoretta decides to give uh, Amphilicus to the priest of Apollo, and she takes uh, Tisiphone into her own service in the Temple of Aphrodite. Now this is based on something that the geographer, the, the Roman era Greek geographer Strabo says about the Temple at Corinth. Um, because according to Strabo, there was thousands of holy prostitutes who worked at the Temple of Aphrodite in Corinth. And people would come and have sex with them for money, and then that money would go to the temple. So they were servants of the goddess, but they also were prostitutes. Now, among contemporary scholars, there's a good amount of debate about whether or not sacred prostitution really existed and whether or not that's an accurate description. Um, but I'm not going to, to delve into that in, in this video. Um, so, uh, Tesiphone goes into the, ser into the, the service of uh, Aphrodite, she becomes a prostitute, and the first night that she's there, Creon, who she thinks is her father, and Alcmaeon, who actually is her father, show up uh, at the temple. They choose their prostitutes. Uh, initially, Creon wants to, to have Tisiphone, who's wearing a veil, so they don't know who she is, but then Alcmaeon decides he's going to take her, and since he's a celebrity and he saved Creon's life, Creon yields to him. Uh, Alcmaeon ends up not having sex with Tisiphone. Um, Amphilicus shows up, uh, having escaped the priest of Apollo, who tried to get him to we tried to get Amphilicus to suck his penis. Um, and Amphilicus almost kills Alcmaeon before it's revealed that uh, they are his children. At which point, uh, Alcmaeon goes blind for reasons that aren't entirely clear. But then uh, Alcmaeon and Amphilicus go back uh, they tell Croesa that they know the whole thing and that she sold the children into prostitution, although it's not necessarily clear she intended them to be prostitutes. It seems more like she intended them to be sort of house slaves, and then the priest of Aphrodite sort of said, hey, you're both kind of sexy, let's make you prostitutes instead. But they reveal to Croesa that they know the whole scheme. Uh, Croesa then shortly after, kills herself off stage. Creon figures out what happened, etc., uh, etc. Et and then Hera shows up, the goddess Hera shows up, and basically is like, all right, here's, what, here's what's going to happen. I'm just going to give you the resolution of the play. So we have a deus ex machina. Um, and basically, uh, Kira says that uh, Tisiphone is to marry Creon, the person who has raised her as a daughter, because there was an oracle of Apollo that the first person who had sex with her would be her father. And so, in some sense, that has to come true. Um, Alcmaeon, because he's now sort of realized that his family was the real treasure uh, and not the gold necklace that Apollo had, had ostensibly sent him to, to Corinth to get. Um, Alcmaeon is sort of forgiven and, and the Irenes are called off. Um, Amphilicus is sent north to found a new town. Um, and basically that's sort of the resolution of the play. Um, but one of the things that's really interesting is that Throughout the play, Tevens included a number of the extant fragments, but because we don't have any context for those fragments, he for the most part incorporates them in places that make sense to him. So it's an inter so 
I mean, normally when, you t when we talk about adaptations, we talk about reworking known source material. Here he's reworking unknown source material in a very postmodern way. Um, and we actually get this sort of directly called to our attention right at the beginning, because here it gives us a sort of opening speech or the, the prologue. Um, in which she reads out a number of these fragments. And as she's sort of going, she's sorting through these fragments and reading them. So uh, the opening speech, or mo I'll give you most of the opening speech. It says, the gods avenge the pollution caused by the murder of a parent. Why should people have children, Father, if they don't help them in adversity? Aren't you aware, young women, what's going on in town? Fragments, snatches of sentences on dusty leaves torn from old book rolls, fresh, fresh fish, fished from the silt of the river of two millennia or more of words. He destroyed Oedipus, and Oedipus destroyed me, all because of a golden necklace. In speech I explained that woman is the greatest benefit and the worst ill for a man to bear. Argena, becoming white. O children, of, O child of Creon, how true it is, the noble children are born of noble men, and children of ignoble men resemble their fathers in nature. So let us weave these words, the last stray and fraying threads. Let us weave them into a fine peplos, a dress fit for a goddess. Begin them. So we've got this postmodern approach where the beginning of the play draws attention to the way in which this play is constructed both in terms of the use of fragments, uh, fragments in a frame that's been lost, and in terms of pulling things together into a new structure.